It was a wonderful promise of endless growth. Of opportunities to harness the earth. And what seemed like its limitless depths. Of the black gold that would run the world. From one end to the other. And even beyond. This is a world racing to be richer and richer. But for this world, even the whole Earth is not enough. The Earth has its limits. And if not respected, it revolves in fearsome ways, through the clouds and the seas. But there is another world, both old and new, that has a habit of finding ways to soothe the tired earth. A way of life that hums with the earth. This hum that is healing the injured earth. These are among the richest forests on the planet. But this abundance is harder. A few decades ago, these forests in northeast India were overexploited. Their woods sold and wildlife hunted down. Until things reached a breaking point and pushed the local people to turn the tide. They voluntarily declared large tracts of community and private areas as protected forests. This is a uh, Saint Denis villages conservation area. We have totally banned uh, hunting, uh, fishing, all agricultural activities, and even collection of vegetables and other uh, forest produces are totally banned. And anybody caught. Uh, Roaming around in this reserve uh, without uh, our knowledge are penalized. The collective decisions of the community are sacrosanct. Thanks to this wisdom, today Nagaland has nearly 500 community conserved areas that are flourishing without any formal support of the government. This Sukhai CCA area is very rich in biodiversity. In this small CCA area, around 450 hectares, we have collected more than 120 species. We have collected like medicinal plant, animal fodder, some trees bear fruit, as well as some for vegetable purpose. This name is Michis. This name is Apikus. This bear name is this biodiversity has returned over 15 long years. However, it can be lost within moments.
While forests around the world are being brutally knocked down, in some parts of India they have flourished because of its people. Ordinary people who can show extraordinary courage. Back in the 1970s, a few women from the northern state of Uttarakhand stunned the world with their daring act to save their forest. When the fellers came to cut them down, they hugged the trees and triggered one of the most famous environmental movements of the world, the Chipko movement. We said that we will go to the tree, we will go to the tree, we will go to the tree. So they thought that they are dead, and they were dead, so they were dead. They said that they were going to go to the jungle, but we will not give them to the jungle. They said that the jungle is ours, but I said that the water is not in the house of anyone's house. But for a large majority of poor forest-dwelling communities in India, protecting the forest is a difficult choice, especially when it is their only means of sustenance. However, this reality is being turned on its head. Loggers are being transformed into protectors. Across India, several state governments are entrusting local communities with ownership of their forest and giving them rights to guard, conserve and manage them sustainably. Empowered with modern techniques, several communities are shifting to new means of livelihood leaving the forest to regenerate and flourish. This is India a fascinating kaleidoscope of challenges, but also hopes, problems, but also solutions. Here, people worship every element of nature. This reverence has played a significant role in sustaining a country of 1.2 billion people. One third of India is urban and often restless, eager to catch up with the rest of the world. The other two-thirds is calmer and wiser. This India still lives on scarce resources, but it has deep content within. Here, less is more. Unlike some other parts of the world where more is never enough. Massive monoculture farming, laden generously with pesticides and fertilizers, was hailed as a technological triumph. Today, it has ruined the soil, water and biodiversity in most parts of the world. In Jardhar Gaon, a small village in the Indian Himalayas, a group of farmers have been on a mission to preserve their native seeds. Their movement started way back in the 1980s, after their produce declined sharply from chemical-fed hybrid seeds. Adunik weeds पहली बार खूब पैदावार देता है किसान खुश हो जाता है बंपर क्रॉप होगी लेकिन अगले साल उसको लगाएंगे तो कम होते जाएगा कम होते जाएगा और जो पारंपरिक बीज है एक बराबर चलेगा वो पैदावार कम नहीं होने देगा इस साल सूखा पड़ गया लेकिन जो मिले टॉली फसलें हैं ये सूखे को फिर भी झेल जाते हैं अगर ज़्यादा बारिश हो गई तो उसे भी झेल जाते हैं लेकिन जो आधुनिक बीज हैं वो उनमें किसी भी तरह की क्षमता नहीं होती है सूखा झेलने की या ज़्यादा बारिश के लिए
the nature of traditional farming is self-sustaining because every nutrient for the crop is sourced locally. हम खाद नहीं गिरता हम गोबर गिरता हूँ बस और जंगल से लियो ना वो पातीन वो पातीन लियो ना हमुन ना वो बोरियों पर वो सड़ों ने गड्ढा पर गिरने हमुन हूँ ना तब वो एक गोबर हुए जाने तब वो ऐली जानो हम कहते हो The farmers of Jardhar Gaon maintain a rich seed bank with hundreds of native and robust varieties of rice, beans, and a whole lot of other crops. Community seed banks across India are bravely countering the forces behind chemical farming. They believe in the common values of sharing and conserving the rich genetic diversity they inherited. Hundreds and thousands of small farmers in India have today regained their sovereignty over seeds. Their communities are healthier and they are better prepared to deal with the challenge of climate change. This old wisdom is now getting respect from urban India. The demand for organic food in cities is rising every day and its future looks ever more promising. It is the most awaited news in India, the arrival of the monsoon. The rain brings so much along. Two-thirds of India's people depend on the rain for a living. They are a part of its predominantly agricultural economy. But some other parts of India are not as blessed. नमस्कार आकाशवाणी जयपुर अजमेर से शांतिकालीन प्रादेशिक समाचारों में आपका स्वागत है प्रदेश में मॉनसून की बेरुखी के कारण सूखे की आशंका मंडराने लगी है वर्षा की कमी के कारण संभाग के बाड़मेर जिले में तो स्थिति और भी खराब है इट इज अ डिस्ट्रेसिंग सिचुएशन बट ड्राउट्स आर अ पार्ट ऑफ लाइफ इन दार डेजर्ट Spread over the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent, this is one of the hottest regions in the world. It rains the least here. There are no perennial rivers, and groundwater is saline. The piped water supply often fails to reach remote villages. In one such drought in 2009, the local administration of a town called Barmer. decided to challenge the situation they involved the local communities to drive a mass campaign to revive the traditional practice of harvesting rainwater under a national job guarantee program thousands of men and women were drawn to building new water harvesting structures while renovating the old ones Over 45,000 household tanks were constructed, each with a capacity to meet the drinking water needs of a family for at least six months. Nearly 2,000 community ponds were built to take care of the needs of the community and their livestock. Almost 500 traditional wells that were lying in neglect were also revived. These could extract sweet water from the earth. even during consecutive years of drought jis tarike se humne kaam kiya global problems ka aur local problems ka sustainable solution hai kyunki wahan ki knowledge se wahan ke logo ke prayas se wahan ke logo ki mehnat aur samajh se wo kaam hue it is this grit and wisdom of its people that makes thar one of the most densely populated deserts of the world despite the harsh conditions they endure they live a spirited life for a world faced with severe water shortages 
Their message is simple. Don't let it go waste, because every drop counts. Kundai, in Odisha, eastern India, is one of the thousands of its villages that is not electrified. And Chanda, one of the millions of women who cook on open fires. The poor cannot avoid this smoke if they have to survive, and sometimes they also succumb to it. It's a difficult situation. But in 2007, a campaign called Lighting a Billion Lives took upon this challenge by bringing clean and affordable energy to the doorstep of the poor. In thousands of far-flung villages that are off the grid, communities are waking up to the power of the sun. Smart solar devices are giving them clean lighting and cooking solutions. Relieved from the fumes of kerosene and fuel wood, millions of rural Indians are not only stepping into a better life, they're also doing their bit to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. The rows go on as far as the eye can see. With a capacity to produce over 600 megawatt, this is Asia's largest solar park in the Thar Desert in India. Today, it is a marvel. But five years ago, a grid-connected solar park was a novel idea with few takers. The government uh, told me when I discussed with the government of Gujarat, we, somebody has to take the risk and let us take the, uh, take the risk to prove to the world that this is possible because coal we have to pay, gas we have to pay, nuclear we have to pay, but sun is free. Why don't we harness this sun energy in a, in a big way? It is the big way. Following Charanka's success, nearly 25 major solar parks are coming up across India's vast deserts and wastelands. India's resources may be scarce, but its ideas are abundant. This canal top solar project on the Narmada Canal in Gujarat, the first such in the world, has avoided the use of precious land and saves millions of litres of water from evaporation. And then there are rooftops. In the city of Gandhinagar, Unused rooftops of public and private buildings are feeding electricity into the grid. Taking cue, a host of cities are preparing to tap the sun on their rooftops, helping to make the grid more efficient and secure. 
It's an idea whose time has come. Meeting the energy needs of the world's second most populous country is a constant struggle to fill the supply-demand gap. One-fourth of Indians don't even have a basic electricity connection. Millions others suffer through severe power cuts. But one big idea is changing the game, and it is the humble light bulb. Amid great fanfare, local legislators in the southern state of Andhra Pradesh are busy promoting the LED lighting program in their constituencies. This hysteria has spread to the remotest corners of the country. But it is understandable if you're given a 500 rupee LED bulb for just 10 rupees. All you need to do is return your old incandescent bulb to get a new LED one. So who foots the bill for the steep discount given to consumers? The LED bulb consumes one-tenth the energy used by an incandescent lamp. As the electricity bills drop almost by half, the consumers will give easy monthly installments to their distribution company to repay the cost of the LED bulb. Beyond homes, cities are also lapping up the idea. Welcome to Vishakhapatnam, a city that lost most of its streetlights to a massive cyclone. Now it is relit 100% with LED lights. In six months, Vishakhapatnam's electricity bill has come down by half. Andhra Pradesh is leading the way. The rest of India is catching up quickly. The amount of energy used in most Indian households is very small, especially when compared to global uh, averages. However, even if they do a small bit of savings and you multiply it by a billion households, that's a lot of energy. The energy saved would be more than the energy used by many countries. That is the kind of opportunity we have.